now for six weeks, and we we barely made it inside. And last week we started talking about the inner uh, the inner walls of this tabernacle, and you'll see the wood at the bottom of the tabernacle. That's where we arrived. It took us six weeks to get to those. Would somebody tell me, if you don't mind, tell me, thank you, Elder Bill, tell me what these wood, these wood posts were made out of. Does anybody remember? Say it again. Shittim. Shittim wood. Yeah. But what was it overlaid with? Gold. Now somebody tell me what we learned these boards being overlaid with gold represents what? Someone tell me. Our carnal nature. Mm -hmm. That's the heavenly nature. That is the two men coming together. The Every one of you have a carnal side and everyone has a heavenly side. Now everyone don't have a heavenly side. Only those that have taken on the heavenly mind, have these two things. What else did we study in this tabernacle? I want to see if anybody got their mind together today. There was something else we studied in the tabernacle about these two natures as well. Does anybody remember what it was in this tabernacle about the two natures? There was another item, uh, and we blended two natures together to get Something else? Say it again. Say it again. The, 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 that's right, the curtain. The curtain. Remember, there was three colors in the curtain. Crimson is the Hebrew word maggot. Which we're all lowly as the maggot in our human nature. But then the other color was blue. Heavenly blue. You blend those two together to create your royalty. Purple. All through the tabernacle we are being taught a lesson and the lesson that we are learning, Elder, is that you and I were born with a destiny and that destiny is not hell nor heaven. Now, the entire Christian church believes you were born to wake up for 75 years, go to sleep for 75 years, to eat three meals a day, go to the bathroom twice, take a shower, hopefully, every day, and that's your purpose for life. Oh, and to put money in the bank. And when it's all over, you've got a ticket to hell or heaven. Now, the problem with that is this. If that's the purpose of my life, then shoot me now. Because I have no reason to keep living. If, if, I'm, if when I got saved, that's the reason. I mean, in the Christian church, that is the whole reason that every church exists to get you saved then there ought to be Kool-Aid in every church. As soon as you get saved, drink a cup, and there you go. That's what, and the problem with that is this. You find a ministry like this one that teaches on the Sabbath day, the holy days, and all of these things. And, and as a matter of fact, when we teach against the Trinity, and we teach you the oneness of God, what is the point of even caring, Elder Bill, about those things if our purpose is heaven or hell? Why even give a rat's behind if, if that's... Who cares about doctrine? Now you see why no church teaches doctrine. There's no reason to teach it. We've got everybody saved. Why teach doctrine? As a matter of fact, you turn on the television, they will proudly tell you, in this church, we don't teach doctrine. 
we teach what? Anybody know the word? Love. That's the most misunderstood word in the whole Bible. They have turned love into perversion. They've turned God into a child molester. Oh, yes. It's only a child molester that loves a child with no discipline. Only a child molester calls you to sit on their lap and give you candy without giving you discipline. And that's what we've turned God into. So the purpose of the tabernacle is to say, no, no, no. You were not born to go to heaven or hell. Brother Hartsfield, you've been in the ministry how many years? Close to 20, about 19. 19 years. In what denomination? Baptist. Baptist. <laughs> Pentecostal. All right, so we've got a Baptocostal in the house. Now, all those years, if you grew up with the same mentors that I did, well-meaning, wonderful ministers, I was always taught, when you're preaching that sermon, you have one goal, to get somebody in the altar. That's the only reason we preached. We judge the success of our ministry on the altar call. If you've ever been to our church, I don't think I've done an altar call in probably four years. Because I found out something. My preaching is the altar call. We're not trying to get you to an altar to make a decision. We're trying to get you out of the altar to change your lifestyle and to create something that was not there before. To overlay your wood with gold. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. So where we're picking up today is at the bottom. Let me pull this slide up and I want to show you the most important part of this tabernacle is always the least mentioned. And this is where we left off last week. And I want to really focus on these. If you've not seen the, these six weeks, you seriously need to go back and watch these six weeks. Look at this slide here. <clears throat> at the bottom of the wooden boards or the gold boards were silver sockets. Each board has two silver sockets. Now, here's my question. Would any of that frame be able to stand without those silver sockets? Now, no matter how many works you add to your faith. See, we get accused a lot, Elder, of preaching a works-based salvation. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because we're not even really focused on salvation. You can never, ever, Sister Herky, earn the free gift of grace. You know, you don't earn that. Yeah. That, you can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to make God so happy about you that you're going to get salvation. Nothing you can do. Nothing. You can't get baptized. You can't keep the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath has never saved anybody. If you don't believe me, Go look at the mess in the Messianic movement. Okay, keeping Sabbath saves no one. Keeping Sabbath helps no one that does not have these silver sockets. And what are these silver sockets? Silver is the metal of redemption. Gold is the metal of divine nature. Silver is the metal of redemption. Brother Keith, so good to see you today. I've been missing you, son. Glad to see you in person. Didn't make it to Pentecost, but I forgave you. <laughs> so he made up for it today. I love it. Bless you, my brother. <clears throat> We're going to talk about these silver sockets today. Because i got a feeling when I get done, you're going to understand the most important part of your walk with God. And we're going to start off with the story of silver. Let's go to Exodus chapter 30. 
verse 12 through verse 16. Exodus 30, 12 through 16. And I'll read this, Elder Morgan, because uh, if I don't, if you read it, they won't be able to hear you in this room. So I will do it today. Yes, sir. Exodus 30. Thank you. Good to see you, brother. I miss you. We miss y'all, Pastor. <laughs> sorry, y'all can't hear us. We're having a whole conversation over here. I'm sorry y'all are out of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Exodus 30, verse 12. When you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto Yahweh. When you number them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. And here's what they shall give. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered hath a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And half a shekel shall be an offering unto the Lord. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto Yahweh. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto Yahweh to make what? Atonement for their soul. And when you take the atonement money of the children of Israel, you shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before Yahweh to make atonement for their soul. Somebody tell me two words that stuck out to you in that four verses. Atonement and the half shekel. What is a shekel made out of? Silver. So, atonement and silver go hand in hand. What he said was, if you want to be redeemed or your sins atoned for, bring silver. So when we get to the bottom of this tabernacle, we already know that you cannot get to the divine nature until your sins have been atoned or until you have been redeemed. At the foundation, brothers and sisters, of everything, is the man, Yahshua, the Messiah, and his sacrifice for our sins. Your faith has to be not in the good works of the gold, but your faith must be in the foundation of this tabernacle. Now, I give much credit to the Baptist church for preaching about this silver. Amen? The problem is, we need to build a building beyond the foundation. Thank you. We need to create a third temple. And no, that will not be created in Jerusalem. Yahweh's almost finished building this third temple. And it's going to look just like the first one. This first temple is the pattern of Solomon's temple, and it's the pattern of the temple Yahweh's building right now. Here's what he's building. The foundation of salvation by grace. But then he said, now add to your faith the golden walls. The salvation is not up to you, but the walls are. Did you hear what I just said? The foundation is free, but the walls are built by you. When you take the salvation of God and let it begin to work in your life, you'll begin to see your wood nature being overlaid with gold, that divine nature. It'll grow every day if your faith 
is in the silver and not the gold. Hallelujah. And the problem with so many messianics in our movement, they find these truths of Sabbath and, and, and the coming kingdom of God. And all of a sudden their focus is on the golden wall. And that makes you pharisaical. That turns you into a Pharisee. On the Sabbath day, that's got you looking to see what another Sabbath keeping is doing or not doing on the Sabbath. It turns you into a Pharisee. We don't do that around here. Our faith is in the silver. I said our faith is in the silver, the redemptive work of Christ. Hallelujah. Now I want to talk to you some more about this silver to help you understand. The only people that will be boards in the new temple must truly understand redemption and how to preach redemption. Now, I'm fixing to get into a subject that many of you may not quite understand. But Yahweh radically changed me in 2009. And he began to show me his plan for all mankind. And I'm sorry, that plan is not. Let me ask you a question. If you were Michelangelo, Brother Lutz, your poor arm, somebody give you a break in a few minutes. Look, we're going to do swap out. Somebody help her in a minute, okay? If you were Michelangelo, Sister Herky, and you had just did, you had just did the Mona Lisa, and I mean that is your life work, that is your best. And you created this with the intention of one day ripping it all up and burning it all up. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yahweh's greatest creation was mankind and planet Earth. Every church you've ever gone to has convinced you that God plans to burn it all up. His greatest creation. Do you know that earth is more beautiful than heaven? I do. Thank you. Thank you. It was. It was. And it will be again. Brother Vaughn, you are crazy. I, I thought so too, but let me show you in the scripture. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but yet the angels wanted to come to earth. The Bible said when Yahweh created this earth, the angels were dancing and rejoicing at the beauty. Now, if heaven was so much more beautiful, then wouldn't you be weeping when you saw this lesser creation? Yahweh created planet earth for the angels. Who do you, where do you think Stonehenge came from? Where do you think uh, these things came from that no man can explain? The angels, this was their planet. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. It's in your Bible. Ezekiel, Isaiah, you can find out that Yahweh made Satan the high governor of planet Earth and gave him this planet. And we know that's the truth because when Yahshua was in the wilderness, Satan offered to give it to Yahshua. He said, because it was given to me. Well, who's the only person that could have gave it to Satan? The one that created it. That's why Satan is still God of this world. That's why you're never going to win the world. Revelation 12 and 9 says the whole world is deceived. Everybody is deceived. Everyone is deceived. Revelation 12 and 9. The whole world. Why? Satan is God of this world. Right. Only those that Yahweh saw through the predestined eyes of election are the ones that will walk out of that deception. And that's the message of silver I want to talk to you about. That's the message. That this third temple that I just showed you on the screen there's going to be a message come out of that temple. And it must be the message 
of redemption. Hallelujah. It must be a silver message. Hallelujah. And until you learn how to preach that message, until you learn how to offer the hope of the world, if you ever want to know why mankind cannot hear your message, because what you're telling them is your life is a living hell. You wake up every day and you live in a living hell. And guess what? You're now fixing to go to an even worse hell when this is all over. All right. Now the Bible says that Yahweh would have all men to be saved. Now that does not happen in this day. And that's what confuses the Christian church. They're trying to save the world that don't want to be saved. All right. They have no desire to be saved. John 6, no man can come to the Father unless he gets a personal invitation by the Holy Spirit. That's the only people that can come. The world will never come, ever, in this lifetime. But if you understand the message of redemption, that's my son. Hold on, he knows better than to call me right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's read Leviticus 5 and 15. Let's talk more about this silver now. Because you've got to learn the message of silver today. That's a message you have to learn in this ministry. Is the message of silver. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 15. How old are you? Yeah, this is just kind of a basic overview, oh, yeah. John, because uh, yeah, I've spoken with experts who, who admittedly say, I mean, the laws are murky, they're confusing. So in uh, September of 2021, thank you. There we go. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you a question. Let's say that I put a blindfold around your eyes, okay? And I bring you right out there where that cliff is. Okay. And you're blind. You can't see anything. Right. And I tell you, now walk. And you fall off the cliff. And then I come down the cliff and I beat you to death because you fell off the cliff. <laughs> What would you think about me, son? <laughs> would you think I was messed up in the head? That's the gospel we preach. Amen. God's blinded the whole world. He's allowed the whole world to be blinded, and then He's going to torture them for all eternity for being blind. That's why the God you serve, the message you have preached, has not been a silver message, it's been a rusty message. Yes. Amen. But this third temple is going to preach true redemption. God is, let me, let me, I'm going to ask you a deeper question than that. Why is all this evil in the world? Oh, it's the devil. Well, hold on now. Now you better hold on. If you're going to blame the devil, we have to go back even further than that, find out who created the devil. And then we have to ask this question. Did you know that that devil was going to turn bad? If he says no, then it's not God. Because he knows the end. Help me somebody. So if you knew that Satan was going to turn evil and, and destroy all humanity, now whose fault is it? Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad I know this silver message. 
I'm so glad I understand redemption. I'm glad I understand why God created the devil. Go watch my teaching on the ministry of Satan. I'm glad to know that Satan is a minister in the hand of Yahweh. And he's working all things out towards the redemption of all mankind. In order for God to be a healer, there has to be somebody sick. There's got to be somebody to make them sick. In order for God to be a father, there must be a fallen child for him to redeem. For him to be a restorer, he must let everything fall apart and he must create the entity that's going to make it all fall apart. Come on now. When you understand this message, all of a sudden the God you serve becomes more. Let me ask you, Raven. You grew up hearing about Christ and God, and yet you became a pagan. What was it about the pagan gods that impressed you more than the God of the Bible? They seem to be more forgiving. Ah, more forgiving. Oh, wow. More interested in humanity? Yes. In our daily lives? Right. That's why we cast spells. The I guess you could say uh, God over the rest of them was a woman. It was Mother Earth. Mother Earth. And that's why in the church we have to be careful of that Mother Earth spirit. And that's where climate change and all that worship comes from. She just said what I wanted to hear. The people run to paganism because their gods are more forgiving than our God. And brothers and sisters, somebody's going to answer one day for preaching a God that is a psychopath to humanity. Amen. God is collecting that message today. All across the world, He's awakening His people to the compassion and the loving kindness of God. The Christian church has turned Jesus into the good God and Yahweh into the bad God. But it was not Jesus that loved the world, for Yahweh so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son for the whole world. That's the silver message of redemption. And we must begin to preach it to every man woman and child we must begin to know that god's got a plan and this third temple is going to become the purveyors of that great truth hallelujah leviticus chapter 5 verse 15 if a soul commits a sin through ignorance what does that mean he's blind He's blind. How many of you in your life committed sins ignorantly? You were blind. That was me. In the holy things of Yahweh, then he shall bring for his trespass unto Yahweh a ram without blemish. And what else? Shekels of silver. Silver is the message. Listen carefully. For the sins of ignorance. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, nobody's hearing me. And I'm going to try to break it down. The whole world is committing sins of ignorance. The Bible said they have eyes. Help me, somebody. But they cannot. They have ears. Would you call that sins of ignorance? Oh yeah, when you look at all these young boys that have been molested and they turn out to be homosexual and we want to just make them the, the, the scum of the earth. Listen to me. Do you think that they grew up wanting to be molested? Do you think they grew up wanting these things to be introduced to them? No, many of them are committing sins through ignorance. The, oh, Brother Vaughn, they've heard the gospel. Yahshua said, I preached to them, but they heard me not. Hallelujah. They're blind. And the Bible said in Torah that if they've sinned ignorantly, 
They just need a little silver is all they need. Hallelujah. They just need to bring a little silver because the message of redemption is in the silver. The foundation of this third temple will be the gospel of redemption for all men. That is what Yahweh is called first harvest to do. Not only to find the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but to take that condemnation out of you and to let you know that what your neighbor's doing is not your concern. Many of them are ignorant. But one day, God's going to remove their blindness. One day. Preach the silver message of truth. Be the message that's going to come out of this third temple. It's not God's fixing to get every one of you. He's about to kill all of you. That won't come out of this temple. Oh, there will be another message come out of this temple. And here's that message. The God we serve is so filled with loving kindness and compassion that His mercy always supersedes His judgment. It's new every day. And can I tell y'all something? His mercy didn't run out when you died in your sin. Say it, sister. We've got to preach this message of silver truth. Why? Brothers and sisters, I grew up believing that if we didn't knock on every door and if we didn't find everybody that they would be lost for eternity. But that didn't line up with another scripture that said on that day every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. Now according to what I've read in the Bible, the only thing you have to do to be saved is confess with your mouth that Yahshua is Lord. And I just read a scripture where everyone will be saved because every mouth will confess that Yahshua is Lord. But you see, if you're not careful, you will think that because you're walking in holiness, that now we can condemn those that do not. That's not our place. We're building a building. And we're going to walk in this path. And if, if none go with me, the old song says, still I will follow. Why? I've been called to this. It's my day. My day is today. This is my day of salvation. Hallelujah. I'm so glad he called me. And now you might understand why. Hallelujah. They couldn't just bring Yahshua to the cross for the sins of the world, but they had to bring 30 shekels of silver with him. That's why Judas had to betray him. Saw that silver. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. Do you understand? Why Judas had to be like I'm the only preacher in the world that believes Judas is going to be saved too. Uh, oh yeah, I thank you. I do. I why do I believe it? I'll tell you why I believe it. Because the Bible said that Judas loved Yahweh Yahshua so much that when he realized when the blindfold came off and he realized what he did, that he went and threw that silver in the temple and repented and he was so distraught he didn't want to live another day. Amen. But somebody had to do it. Somebody had to fulfill that role. Don't y'all realize we're all in a play? Don't you understand this ain't nothing but a play? Do you understand we're just all on a stage and Yahweh the great puppet master is in control of everything. Judas had to bring 30 pieces of silver. Why? Because in the Torah, that was the cost to redeem a slave. Every one of you were slaves to sin and Yahweh wanted to redeem you. To do it, he had to keep Torah. Hallelujah. He had to keep Torah. Everything has to be done by Torah. Everything. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful 
so that you can put that on originals. Okay, amen. Now, all right, it's on now. Now, what I want y'all to understand as we continue in this lesson is the silver message of redemption that's being preached. If we are the silver sockets, the silver trumpets, the silver shekels, we have to understand redemption. Somebody say, redemption, redemption. is not forgiveness. It's not forgiveness. We've always thought that we were forgiven. The problem with forgiveness, it comes and goes. Redemption, which is what the silver, silver don't represent forgiveness, it represents redemption. Now, the problem with redemption is we're not preaching it correctly. Redemption is the full restoration of that which was sold under bondage if you were a slave in Torah and you were redeemed with 30 pieces of silver, it does not mean that you are forgiven. It means that you are back to the condition that you were before you were sold into slavery. Fully redeemed or restored. Brothers and sisters, the salvation message is not there to forgive you. It is there to redeem you. And the problem with you and I, we don't have faith in redemption. We believe we're forgiven. But we have a hard time believing that we have been restored to the person that we were before we ever committed one sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fully redeemed. Amen. Not just forgiven. If you don't have faith in your redemption, you, if you need to watch my series, Goodbye Guilt. Three, ser three sermons in Goodbye Guilt that will change your life. Because the first thing that happens when you come into this Torah observant lifestyle, guess what's going to happen tomorrow, Brother Herky? You're going to mess up. And here's going to come the devil in your mind. And here's what he's going to say. If you can't keep all the law, no need in keeping any of the law. Why even try if you failed in one point, you, you failed in the whole thing. You better watch Goodbye Guilt and it will explain it all to you. But brothers and sisters, redemption is your foundation. Listen to me and listen well. You will quit building the golden walls if you don't have faith that you're fully redeemed. Wow. Wow. Hallelujah! You'll give up on the building because you keep being brought back to who you think you are still. A fallen man. I want you to hear me. If you've been redeemed by the shed blood of Yahshua, there is nothing fallen in you anymore. Nothing. You are fully redeemed to what Adam was in the Garden of Eden. You are fully restored. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God. He had no gout in his mouth. Place your faith in the foundation of this message. I'm not keeping the Sabbath because I'm trying to get holy. No, I have so much faith in the foundation of my holiness that it allows me to keep the Sabbath. Woo, hallelujah! You've got to know it! Amen. And when the enemy comes to tell you nothing's changed about you, if you believe it for one second, here's what you have said. I have no faith in redemption. I have no faith in silver sockets. Woo! But when you know you're redeemed, you can stand up tall as golden walls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the real, God. 
God. Stand up. Hallelujah. Get your foundation right. If you believe in redemption, even when you fail, Hallelujah. you can't yeah. fall. Yeah. Yeah. You can't fall. That's why the Bible said concerning Abraham, I won't get into that because I'll go to preaching like a maniac if I talk about that. Go watch Goodbye Guilt. A fully redeemed man must be exactly of the same status physically and spiritually as Adam was. Do you know what you were before you committed your first sin? Now, by the way, we do not believe here in the doctrine called original sin, by the way. Okay? So, I know the whole church world believes that. We don't. Listen to me. Death came by one man but not sin. Somehow we've taught that when you're born, you're born a fallen man. No, 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 no. You're born with a sentence of death. But until you sin, you are in the condition that innocent child, that little angel baby, is not a fallen man. Hallelujah. He is fully and completely innocent. Now, he has a sentence of death that's on all mankind because of our fall. But you listen and listen well. When Yahweh redeems you, he brings you back to that little girl that was never touched. He brings you back to that before them thoughts entered your mind. He, he fully reached, he reached, he said, you are innocent before me. Amen. Amen. And brothers and sisters, if you don't put your faith in that silver message of redemption, you can never build these golden walls. Ever. What a wonderful God. Ever. He loves you so much that He said, I want to teach you these silver sockets. That's our foundation. I want to read to you Amen. from Paul's writings, Romans chapter 6. Let's go read it. Verse 6. That's why when people tell me, Pastor, everybody in my town thinks we are crazy, thinks we're trying to earn our salvation. I know of no other ministry that preaches the total opposite. We never preach you earn salvation. We've never believed that for one second. We do believe you'll earn your rewards in the kingdom of God. Amen. That's the golden walls. But those silver sockets are free of charge. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad the silver sockets are free of charge? Hallelujah. Knowing this, somebody say, I know this. I know this. The old man is dead. I know this. I don't hope it. I don't, I don't think, maybe, hey, that's a good idea. I know this. Know it. I know it. I just know it. Why? Because... I know his word. He said that the old man is crucified with Christ. That the body of sin is now destroyed. Now how do we know it? It didn't say because you will never sin again. You'll know it because you will no longer serve sin. Hallelujah. The difference in a sinner and a saint, I've told it a million times, this church ought to know it by heart, is not the lack of sin. It's the lack of repentance. Amen. We don't serve sin. Amen. People that serve sin take pleasure in sin. People that fall into sin jump out so fast. Oh, hallelujah. People people that don't serve sin, they are not happy with what they've done. Amen. There is a natural something in there saying, hey, yes, you've sinned, but don't serve it. Run from it. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Why do we run from it? Because we know that we are crucified with Christ. Yeah. And we don't serve sin anymore. It didn't say we don't commit sin. It said we don't serve sin. Yeah. There are people that woke up this morning in the bed of a lover and they're still laying in it. 
they serve it. They're glad to be there. There's not one moment of, oh God, what have I done? Hallelujah! That's the difference in a child of God. We don't serve sin. That's right. We do like Joseph. We run from it. Run. We run from it, children. We run from it. Verse 6, verse 7, For he that is dead is free from sin. Let's read verse uh, 20, 22. Scroll down, let's go to verse 22. But now, being made free from sin, we have become servants unto Yahweh. And because of that, what is the result? Golden walls. Holiness. And what will be the end of it? Everlasting life. Listen to me carefully. When you know these silver sockets will hold you up. When the wind starts blowing, these silver sockets will hold you up. You have to know every day, sister, you have to know deep down, I am redeemed. In the old church, we used to sing, I am redeemed. I'm bought with a price. Yahshua, He changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, I want you to tell them, I am redeemed. I know I'm redeemed. I know I'm redeemed. Pastor, oh, do you, precious never, Father. Do you Hallelujah. never fail the Lord every day? But I am redeemed. Hallelujah. I've been bought with a price. And I know it. And when I know it, here's what happens. Even when I fail, here's what happens. I keep building them golden walls. <laughs> Why? My faith is in the socket. Hallelujah. Woo! My faith is in the socket. I'm going to give these ladies a break. I'm going to stand still for them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. Let's turn there quickly. You've got to have faith in these silver sockets. For the law of the Spirit of life in Yahshua has made me free. Now watch this. How many has ever told you? Oh, pastor, bringing y'all back to the law. You're following Vaughn. He's bringing y'all back to the law. We've been set free from the law, they say. Well, 50% of what they just said is correct. They missed the other 50%. We are free from the law, and I'll show you which one we're free from. Verse 2 is the answer. He's made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Oh, I'm free. I'm free from the law. What is the law of sin and death? It says you have to sin and you have to die. The law of Christ said you are free from sin and you'll have everlasting life. I've been set free from the law of sin and death. Woo, hallelujah. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that's Yahweh, by the way, the Holy Spirit. By the way, Yahweh is the Holy Spirit. There is no Trinity. Listen to me. If there is a Trinity, then Jesus is His own daddy. Now watch this. If there's a Trinity, I need somebody. I'm not a smart man, but I do have a little sense in my head. And something... It sounds like democratic math to me. <laughs> Common core. Yes. Because here's my problem. Yahshua said that Yahweh is his father. Amen. Hmm. But yet it was the Holy Spirit that overshadowed Mary. So who's the daddy, Maury? Who's the daddy? Well, if you believe in a trinity, the daddy ain't Yahweh. 
The daddy's the Holy Spirit. You better run out of any church that teaches the Trinity. It is an abomination to the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. 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 There is no other God beside Him. Him alone. The Bible said that it was Him that was the Father of Yahshua. Not some third person. The very Spirit. Somebody said, well, who is the Holy Spirit? I'll make this real simple. Yahweh said, I am holy. Be ye holy because I am holy. So there's the holy part of it. Yahweh said, I am spirit. There's the spirit part of it. You're looking for Holy Spirit? You found Him. His name is Yahweh. Exactly. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. See, that's the problem. Some of y'all come into these Sabbath-keeping churches, but they're Trinitarian. Or, 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 or they have no idea of the coming kingdom of God. Or they have no idea who Yahshua is, what Yahshua is, on and on and on. Yahweh is, and they have no idea who the house of Israel is. And Yahweh is doing something in this hour to set these things straight with the voice of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm so glad about it. Verse 22, read that with me. Or no, chapter 8, sorry. Chapter 8, verse 2. And now let's read verse 11. But, but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Yahshua from the dead dwells in you, then He that raised up Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. By the way, that's not talking about the resurrection. He's going to quicken your sinful body right now. Amen. It's going to make you alive in Christ so you're not dead to your sins. This is the message that we have to preach if we're going to be part of this temple ministry. Our foundation as overcomers is faith in our full redemption. That we have been fully redeemed to a status of freedom in Christ. Otherwise, all we have is forgiveness. For example, you could be someone's daughter and you've been living in a mansion at your mama's house eating gold and cheesy bread out of bowls of silver and one day you make mama mad. She kicks you out the house. Now you living at the homeless shelter. And you call up mama and tell mama you sorry. And she said, I forgive you, honey. Just don't come home. <laughs> That's the difference in forgiveness. Redemption says go back to the room you was in. Fully restored. We're not looking for forgiveness. The silver sockets Amen. is full redemption. Hallelujah. We can only be the boards in this third temple if we know the quality of the silver is the security of our standing before Yahweh. I said a mouthful and I don't think you grabbed it. The message must be in the quality of that silver. Thank you, Elder. We have to know this is not fake silver. This is point nine nine nine. This is the real deal. This is silver. It'll stand. They tell me in the olden days they would take a silver nickel and put it in a gallon of milk to keep the bacteria from forming in the milk. Is that right? Yep. Why? The quality of the silver. The day you lose faith in what happened for you at the cross Hallelujah. is the day your golden boards turns into fake gold. Fire. Hallelujah. Strange fire. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. There's not one day you'll ever keep the Sabbath that if you do it, outside of that silver socket. 
It's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got to know that you're planted in silver. Hallelujah. And now once you know that, then you're qualified to fulfill Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's read it. Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. It said, I need you to blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. It is nigh at hand. Listen to me. The trumpet that's going to be blown from Mount Zion. Who is Mount Zion? The third temple. Who is the third temple? The congregation. And we are to be blowing a trumpet. Not just any trumpet. We're about to talk about it. What would you just say? Stay out of my sermon. (laughs) Hallelujah. I want you to blow a trumpet in Zion. I want you to be careful what you're preaching out of my temple. I want you to blow a silver trumpet. I want you to blow forth a message of redemption. I want you to tell the world what I did. Now I don't want you to I, here, I don't want you blowing some brass trumpet. Right. Woo! Brass is condemnation. Yep. Judgment. No, I want you to blow a silver trumpet. Here's why. Here's the, what is you know what a brass trumpet sounds like? I'm fixing to blow it for y'all. Listen. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Only problem is, if somebody don't tell you about it, you're out of luck. (laughs) That's a brass trumpet. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world except Adolf Hitler. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world except for those places where no missionary has found them yet. No. That's a brass trumpet. He loves the whole world. Oh, for Yahweh so loved the whole world that He gave His own. You better preach a silver message. This third temple, this third temple must mount Zion. I want you to blow a trumpet. Amen. I want you to preach a message. True message. And when that true message begins to go forth to the nations of the world, I'll put my blessings upon it. And every person that hears it will know they've heard a certain sound. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo! Amen. But why has that trumpet not blown forth to the world yet? Listen to me. Dear beloved friend, if you thought the last trump of God was going to be sounded forth from heaven, you've misread the scriptures. That's right. Amen. Oh, beloved. (laughs) The reason that trumpet is not sounded to the world yet, it must first sound to Mount Zion. Yahweh must first raise up men and women that will give the clear message to the church so that the Mount Zion can blow forth a clear message. A message of silver sockets. A message of redemption. When the law goes forth from Zion, when this message goes forth from Mount Zion, it hasn't happened yet. It's beginning as I speak to you. Right now, Yahweh is sending me and others like me to little conclaves like this to straighten this people out, to make the path clear, to say, "Uh uh-uh, tune up that sound. Tune up that message from your lips. You stand and declare that the God of heaven intends to lose nothing. You stand and declare that He intends to lose nothing, that He plans to redeem everything and get it all back. Woo! Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. 
He created the lake of fire for one group of people. Entities. Now you tell me why a God that knows everything from the beginning to the end. The Bible said He created hell for Satan and His angels. Do you know why that is, beloved? They are eternal. They cannot die. God blessed us with death. They live forever. Therefore, they must be tormented forever. Oh, but you and I are not eternal creatures. You and I, the Bible said, when we die, we're no different than the animal. When it dies, the dust goes back to the dust. Oh, but beloved, listen to me. There is a people on the earth that's going to get this message right. And when our voice begins to go forth. It may be when I'm dead and gone, but I'm helping to lay the groundwork for the last move of God on planet earth. There is another message. The third angel is sounding another message throughout the world. What is that message? Redemption is coming. Hold on. Redemption is coming to every man, woman, boy and girl. Oh, hallelujah. All right. Amen. Get your message right. The pure word of the Lord. Amen. I want you to look at those two trumpets. What are they made out of? Yeah. Only one time a year did Yahweh not want the shofar blown. Hallelujah. One time a year on the Day of Atonement. He said, on the Day of Atonement, I want you to blow two silver trumpets. Why not the shofar? Because the redemption is going to be the message that's going to go forth in the end of time. There's going to be a redemption message of the redemption of all mankind. And I want that to go forth. Why on the Day of Atonement? What happens on the Day of Atonement, beloved friend? Who is bound? That old Azazel goat. If you've not heard me preach on that Azazel goat, you need to. Why does he tie these two trumpets with that Azazel goat? <laughs> Because you can't redeem all mankind until you bind that old goat up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These trumpets are going to blow when the tempter shall be no more. The Bible said Satan will be bound. And at that moment, the blindfolds will fall off. The silver message of redemption will sound forth throughout the whole world. And all mankind will be redeemed. My God, children, you're blowing the wrong trumpet. Amen. Numbers chapter 10. Let's go to Torah. Let's see what Torah says. Numbers 10, 2 through 4. Quickly. I'm running out of time. I've come to preach tonight. We're going to get our message right. We've got to become preachers of redemption. Not forgiveness, redemption. Amen. Make yourself two trumpets of silver. Of hammered work shall you make them. And you shall use them for two reasons. One for the summoning of the congregation and for having the camp set out. Now, notice this carefully. And when both are blown, both trumpets, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the doorway of the tent of meeting. But if only one trumpet is blown, then only the heads of Israel shall assemble before you. The Kahal. <laughs> I'm trying to calm down because I feel it coming. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. He said on the day of atonement, there's going to be two silver trumpets when Satan is bound. 
two silver trumpets. He said, if you hear one trumpet only, I don't want all of Israel to come. Before I blow both trumpets, I'm going to blow one trumpet. And I don't want all of the church to come. At that time, I don't want all the world to come. I only want the kahal to come. For those that don't know what the kahal is, the ecclesia, the Hebrew word for ecclesia, the church. I only want, the kahal was not the church. The kahal was the first harvest, the first fruits of the church. He said, when you hear one trumpet blow, it's not for the whole church. It's only for the leaders. What is another word for leaders? First, harvest. Government. Kingdom. Amen. Two silver trumpets. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Von Wyatt and this message of redemption being heard in all the Christian churches, darling, those two trumpets hadn't blown yet. There's only one trumpet blowing right now. Don't you understand? And it's only for the leaders of Israel to understand the silver in these trumpets. My God. Amen. Hallelujah. The trumpets were used to summon the leaders of the congregation, depending on how many trumpets were blown. Now you might know why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, he only mentioned one trumpet at the first resurrection. Let's read about it. Oh, somebody just caught it. Who was that? Hallelujah. Sister Herky just caught it. It takes a while for people to catch it, but I like it when they do. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a message and with a voice. And the, is it plural or singular? And the trumpet of God. I want you to hear me. That trumpet and that voice and that angel has already begun to happen among the people of God. He said, I'm going to sound one trumpet. And when when I begin sounding that trumpet, that is not for everybody. It's only for the government of the kingdom. It's only for the kahal. Only for those that are going to rise up. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last singular trumpet. For the singular trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and we shall be changed. Why did... Yahweh pick out two trumpets to give you a prophetic message. And the message is very simple. Two resurrections. The first one will be for the leaders of the house of Israel. The second will be for everybody else. Hallelujah. It's right there, children. Last trumpet. It's right there. Not the, listen, brothers and sisters, when you understand the two trumpets, you will understand that what's happening in the future is already happening in the church. God is sounding forth a voice and an angel and a trumpet. A trumpet is a message. The last trumpet is that second trumpet. That's when all the dead shall be raised. The last trump. The last trump. See, there's going to be a first trump. There's going to be a first resurrection. And the only people coming up in that, Paul said he didn't even know if he would get to make it in that resurrection. Because that resurrection doesn't come from your silver sockets. That one comes from your golden walls. That first resurrection ain't free. That first resurrection will cost you everything. everything. Amen. That's all right. The second one is free. 
But that first trumpet is only for leaders. Those that have laid it all down. Those that have given up everything. They've beheaded themselves. They have cut off their old way of thinking. Their rebellion has been cut off. They have no agenda. They have no plans except for His. Brothers and sisters, this happens on the Day of Atonement. The fullness of redemption was to be blown on a silver trumpet on the Feast of Atonement when Satan is bound. But full redemption will be at that second trumpet. The full redemption has already been given to the Kahal. And now the Kahal must be taken away. Sin must be taken away from our midst so that we can enter into the full blessing and the power of the Feast of Tabernacles. That Feast of Fulfillment. I want to read to you from Joel chapter 3, verse 16. Brothers and sisters, as Yahweh purifies us, He can use us to blow forth this trumpet. Joel 3, 16 and 17. The Lord will roar out of Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. But the Lord will be the hope of His people. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. I want you to notice He's shaking the heaven and the earth. How does that shaking happen? With these silver trumpets. Brothers and sisters, First Harvest Ministries, we are part of that trumpet voice ministry. This ministry is fulfilling the Feast of Trumpets as we speak. Trumpets was a day of awakening. <clears throat> Most of the church world is waiting for Gabriel to toot his horn so they can leave the planet. But I want you to know the trumpet is a voice. Amen. Words, anointed words. Powerful words, awakening words, a message from the throne. This message will come, and it is coming through that body of anointed messengers who have gone through the fire. And like Zechariah 13 and 9 says, refined as silver is refined. Do you understand what's happening to you? God's trying to turn you into silver sockets so you can sound forth a message of true redemption. Don't back down from the fire, but leap joyfully into it. For the Lord has ordained it for your profit. It is time for God's people hearing to change. It's time for the people of the world to hear something new, a new sound from a new trumpet. And that trumpet will be you. While the whole world is disparaging of how bad things are, you're not going to be the trumpet that parrots their message. Hallelujah. Oh, the whole world's falling apart. No, the whole world's lining up, darling. Get your message right. The homosexuals has taken over the world. No, 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 they're not. They're such a small minority. The media likes to hype them up. But I'll tell you what is taking over the world. 17 states in our union now is putting the Ten Commandments back in classroom. That's what's happening. We are the silver trumpet. Hallelujah. Oh, up to something. For the first time in my lifetime, Elder Hallelujah. Baker, 14 Beautiful. states have made killing children unlawful. Yeah. They've turned it into a crime. Yeah. We sound forth a different message. Hallelujah. The biggest worshiper of Satan is not witches. They don't even believe in Satan. Do you know what's so funny? 
I met Anton LaVey. Y'all may not know who he is, but in Sacramento, California, he's the priest, the high priest of the Church of Satan. I was about 21 years old. Do you know the funny thing? The Church of Satan don't even believe in Satan. <laughs> Do you know the, the biggest preachers of Satan's glory is the Christian church? We make evil so big. Poor God. Fear in people. Poor God. No. That's why people get mad at Professor Toto because I won't jump on these little bandwagons of, of some of these things that the world's coming to an end. Baby, the world's just hadn't even got started yet. There's a new age coming. We're living in the cusping of the next age. We're coming out of the last 2,000 years. We're moving into the golden age. My trumpet is clear. My sound is clear. It gives glory to God. It gives all honor to Yahweh. Satan gets no glory from these lips. That's why many people don't understand why I've stood so hard against this new movement of casting devils out of everybody. Amen. Why don't I go to these big tents they put up with these mass deliverance services? I, baby, you're giving way too much attention to the devil. Preach. Way too much attention to the devil. You're going to give a whole service dedicated to the glory of Yahweh to stand there and turn a circus into a show of giving all glory to these manifesting devils? Amen. If you want to get delivered from a demon, sit under my preaching. Yes. 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 Why? Truth will set you free. Amen. Amen. When you begin to learn how little, do you know the Bible says that on that day, brother, that on that day, you can read this, I believe it's in Isaiah, that the Bible said the whole world will look at Satan and say these words. Is that the worm? That little thing. That little thing. At First Harvest Ministries, we intend to keep him a worm. We intend to give him no glory. We intend to give him no credit. He's nothing. He's a defeated foe. He is a defeated foe. Right now, he is on his last rodeo. Yeah, you know, they always show out on that last round. Yeah, they show their best tricks on the last round. Oh, that's why the world's turning upside down. The Bible said Satan is angry because he knows his time is short. He's on his last rodeo. And he knows about to be displaced by the sons of God. Amen. He knows what time it is. Unfortunately, the church doesn't. If the church knew what time it was, they would quit trying to cast the devil out and they'd try to get Yahweh's people to grow up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Prepare. 99% of it is not devils. 99% of it is you. Absolutely. Brother Vaughn, the devil made me, the devil's made, never made you do anything. Ever. He has not the power to make you do anything. Satan has one power, the power of suggestion. He just suggested to Eve that God wasn't being fair. That's all he could do. That's the only power he has. And the moment you agree with his suggestion, you let him move in. The moment you say it is written, he has to move out. <laughs> I had a bunch of people in my local church. They wanted to load up and go to some tent over in Tennessee and have devils cast out of them. No, not Tennessee. Well, yeah, in Tennessee, son. And I, I cried when I heard it. I said, if you allow them to convince you that you've got demons, darling, you don't have demons, you've got flesh. And you need to bring that flesh under subjection to the Word of God. Amen. Because I want to tell you what you do, my brother. The Bible said when you cast out a demon and you don't bring that person 
into a life of obedience. The next day, that demon not only returns, but he brings all his cousins, all his brothers, and they all move in. I'm telling you, until you teach a person commandment keeping and obedience to the Sabbath and obedience to the Word of God, you have not cast out a devil. You have invited more in. But if you'll listen to this preaching and you'll begin to make choices towards God. Choices towards obedience. Every day, sister, you'll look in your house and you'll see a few less devils. Yeah. They'll start moving out. You know why? You've made no room for them. Amen. No room. There's no room here. Oh, I believe in demons. Of course I believe in demons. But I believe they can only go into a house that has been swept and cleaned and prepared for them. That's what Yahshua said. He said, the demon, you cast them out and they come back and look through the window and they find out you've still got a place for them. They bring everybody back in with them. That's true word. But if they come and look back in your house and they see a menorah on your mantle and they see symbolism that this house has been dedicated to the obedience of Yahweh, when they see you in that Word, when they see your ears with an earphone listening to the teaching of the hour, they understand that don't, don't, don't stop here. Don't stop here. They, 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 they come up and they whisper in your ear, well, you know you don't have to do all that. And here's, here's, here's the only way they can come in is if you go, hmm. But if you say, devil, it is written in the Word of God, they know there's no place there for them. None. Amen. I don't know why I talked about that today. I wasn't planning on talking about demons. But I've come to tell, tell you, you've got to get focused on growing in the Spirit. Amen. Yahweh has a plan for you. You were born to rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom of God. Don't allow anything to turn you around. Listen to me. Don't get tired until you win this race. You wake up every day in the Word. There's only one protection in this hour. It's in the Word. You got to stay in it. I was on the airplane last night in the Word. I don't have time. Listen, don't ever think that you can bypass one day in the Word. Uh, the only time you can do that is if the devil ever takes a day off and he does. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I was in the sales business all my life. If you wanted to lose a sale to another salesman, don't show up for work. Listen to me. The only way you'll ever lose to Satan is if you don't show up for work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. you got to be fastened. We're almost done. I'm not even going to read all this good stuff to you. It's so good though. Oh, hallelujah. I want to get to the final part of these Oh, I wish that's a good one right there. I just don't have time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a good one too. I want to go one, one further step. I can't, Sister Tony. I'm out of time, darling. She's in here telling me preach it in my ear. Hallelujah. I want to bring you now past the silver sockets and we're going to close with these. Let's read Exodus 26. 26 through 29. I'm having mercy on the new folks today. Normally we go four or five hours. Hallelujah. Well, I got some new folks. We want them to come back next time. Hallelujah. Let's read these three verses. And you shall make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, 
and five bars for the other side and five bars for the boards for these two westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. Now, notice these boards. I, I'm going to help some of you today. Once your foundation of salvation and redemption is laid, once you've begun building these golden boards in your life, this is the third temple that is forming. But Yahweh said, now hold on, even the gold and the silver will not keep this temple secure from the wind. We've got to finish it up with four bars on the outside. And then on the inside, there was a bar that ran all the way through the center. Five bars, the number of grace. Now watch this. I'm closing. I want to show you why? I want to show you why so many people have come out of the Baptist church and the Catholic church, the Pentecostal churches, and yet, sadly, sister, there has been no effective movement in the earth. Yahweh called us all out. It's me in 09, this family in 09, several... Many of y'all came out after COVID. That's why God shut down the churches so you'd have to listen to me. <laughs> and I'm not even playing about that, by the way. Amen. He shut all the churches down so you'd hear a voice. But why? The Messianics, none of them get along with one another. Why is there no coalescing? Why is there no effective movement? Why is there, dare I say, no organization, no, 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 unity. no unity? Why? I'm going to show you why. Satan doesn't care about the silver sockets. He doesn't care about the golden walls. This little family can be over there in London building a golden board in silver sockets and have no effect on the world. And that's the problem in the Messianic movement. Nobody wants a pastor. Nobody wants to join with other believers. Why? Well, no, we came out of Babylon. But baby, that didn't mean you had to come out of the, of the ecclesia when you come out of Babylon. Well, we're doing our own thing. The problem is somebody lied to you and told you that you was the temple of God. You're not. The Bible said you're a stone of the temple, fitly. Right. The gold will not establish an end time work. A, a silver voice of truth will not be heard in, plant, in planet earth with one family in London, another family in North Carolina doing their own thing. Right. Satan knows it. He couldn't care less what y'all are doing. And I don't mean that in an ugly way. There's no effect. There's no coalescing of a voice. Amen. I want to tell you a story. Four years ago, I had been preaching this message that I'm preaching to you today. I'd been preaching it since 14, 2014. My wife would watch me for years. I'd sit in front of a camera in my office teaching that you can still go find those old videos. They're actually some of the best ones. Amen. I would sit there and teach to a camera three likes, four likes, and if I was having a good day, ten likes. Over four or five years, I'd gathered about 3,000 subscribers on YouTube. Let me tell you what that means on YouTube. If you got 3,000 subscribers, you got about 30 people listening. That's just the way it is. No effect. I was no threat to Satan. We were touching nothing. We were... We were doing our own little thing. But no, I'm going to talk about these bars and I'm fixing to blow you out the water when I do. 
I've come to tell you how Satan has destroyed our movement. And how that Yahweh is raising up an end time movement and connecting it together to become an effective voice. I did that for years. One day, I hope my wife's listening right now. She can testify to this. She's walking through the house, Sister Missy. And I tell her I need her to get me $3,000 out of our savings account. For better cameras. And nobody was listening. She looked at me. I said, God said we got to up the quality. And she's like, honey, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. <laughs> Why you need better cameras? Just use your little webcam. <laughs> I said, no, I want the best. She said, all right. So she went like a good little wife and pulled out 3000 And I jumped on Amazon and bought me three. That's the ones that are in the church right now, those three cameras. And I bought them, and we put them up in the church like we was uh, Joel Osteen. <laughs> and five people sitting in the congregation, mind you. And the cameraman had clear instructions, don't show the congregation, leave it on the pulpit. <laughs> so we bought our cameras. And two or three years later, still nothing. One day, I was in Ohio, not far from here. I believe Cleveland or Cincinnati, somewhere over there. And it was the day after the election, 2020. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Take your phone. I want you to speak to the nation. I'll never forget it. Just like I heard his voice yesterday on the airplane. I want you to take your phone. You've only got 75 followers, but I want you to speak to the nation. <laughs> on Facebook. I left the job. Got in trouble for leaving the job, Lord. Went sat in my truck, grabbed my phone, and he gave me the words to say, the title of it, I said, what happens if Trump does not concede the election? That's, that's all I said. For seven minutes, ironically, that video was seven minutes long. For seven minutes, I explained what the nation had never heard, that there would be something called January the 6th. No one, Brother Hartsfield, had ever heard. No politician, no lawyers. No one had ever heard that the presidential election was only decided on January the 6th. It's like it was a forgotten part of our Constitution. And I told America, this election's not over until January the 6th. So I went back to work. That was it. And then I shut it. I didn't think I'd done anything special. I went back to work. I come home that night. On Facebook alone, 45 thousand friend requests just just in that time I was at work I was like I, I knew there was a glitch something was wrong something was wrong I went to YouTube where I had 3,000 subscribers now hundreds of thousands of subscribers in one day people pay millions of dollars to get that kind of a following and I one day it happened in one day it happened and then the next morning Reuters news on Reuters. You know who's Reuters feeds all the news organizations. Headlines. Who is Shane Bond? <laughs> I like y'all don't want to know. <laughs> I called my wife freaking out. I said, honey, I don't even want to read this article because you know I've made some mistakes in my past. I said, baby, I don't even want to read it. I don't want to see it. I was sick to my stomach. I didn't want anybody to know who Shane Bond was. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I was like Paul. I failed the Lord. I didn't want my name out there at all. That's the last thing I wanted. Luckily, there was nothing bad in that article. That's the only one that wasn't nothing bad in. And, but they wanted to know who I was. They called me a little preacher from Mississippi. And then they fact-checked me. USA Today fact-checked me. 
and they said that that would never, the election would never be decided on January the 6th. They'd never heard of such a thing. That fact check got proven wrong. As a matter of fact, the fact checker that checked me out is now a member of this church and she's on there today watching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Said all that to say this. Yahweh built a platform. He trusted it to me. And he said to me, awaken my people with this platform. We're going to give you an alias. Toto is your alias. It's going to be innocent. Everybody's going to trust Toto even though they won't listen to Pastor Vaughn. But that little dog's going to drag them all the way to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. What does that have to do with these bars on this everything? Because I'm about to show you these four bars. They are missing in the third temple. We're fixing to build them. There are four bars. Why are these bars there? Does anybody know engineering? Why do what say talk to me? Support. Support. Something's got to hold the work together. Amen. Why do we call this the work? Do you know this little ministry has 75 published books? This little ministry. Do you know that we're building in, in Gulfport, Mississippi, a, a world class gathering? campground for the house of Israel to be able to come and coalesce with one another. This little ministry has touched the world. We now have a congregation in Scotland and in Kenya, Africa. Yahweh has done this and now we're coming to the point where we must put the four poles in this building. What are those four poles? I thought you would never ask. I want to show them to you. And we're going to finish up in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to show you the four poles that kept the church together. The third temple began to be built on the day of Pentecost. And I want to show you these four bars that must be put back into the third temple. Acts chapter 2. And we'll start at verse number 41. And they, uh, then they gladly received the word and was baptized. Now, how many of you have, have done that? You've received this message and you were baptized. Can I see your hand? Hallelujah. All right. There is your silver sockets. You received the word. And you were baptized. That's part of your works. There's your golden walls. They received the word and they were baptized. But they would, they would make no difference in the world without the four bars. They received the word, baptized the same day. There was added 3,000 souls. Now watch this. How glorious. Satan wasn't scared of that. He wasn't scared of them receiving the word or being baptized. And he was not scared of 3,000 souls being added. You know why? He's always successful in tearing down the work of God. Amen. God's good at getting a movement started. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost, Elder Baker. Listen, God's good at getting a movement started. But there's one thing even Yahweh cannot do. Keep it together. I'll prove it to you. You look at every move of God. It always falls. You know why? The bars are missing. There's four, I know you're ready to hear about these four bars, but you just wait, I'm getting there. The great Azusa Street movement. 
in the 1900s. Move of God splintered today all over the world. In 2009, Yahweh began calling us out of Babylon. But mark my words down. Yahweh's going to raise up a man or a woman that's going to throw these four bars in this temple so Satan does not destroy this end time work. What are those bars? You're like, my God, he's asked me 40 times. What are those bars? <laughs> Here they are in verse 42. Bar number one. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's bar number one. And in fellowship. That's bar number two. And in breaking of bread. Bar number three. And in prayer. Bar number four. Elder Baker receiving the word was not enough. No, sir. Baptism was not enough. This great revival that started in the upper room would end as quickly as it started unless these four bars were placed into the movement. Hallelujah. And I want to talk about that first bar, the Apostles' Doctrine. If you came to this message, listen to me carefully, for Shane Vaughn, you will not be here next year. Let me tell you why. You're going to find a fault with Shane Vaughn every day. I'm a broken man. I'm no better than anybody in this room. I got stuck with this job. I didn't ask for it. I wasn't looking for it. I had a peaceful, quiet life. I wasn't hated by everybody. I was pretty much liked. I got good char uh, charisma. People liked me until God messed my world up. Hello. Listen to me. If you're here for Professor Toto, we won't see you next year. If you're here because... You just saw something happening and you wanted to be a part. You won't be here next year. If everything in this ministry is not about doctrine, you will not survive. Right. Foundation. I'm going to tell you now, the teachings, turn my lights on so the people can see me now, Elder. This ministry is not built on music, even though we have great music. Amen. We're not built on emotions, even though we love to have a good church service. It's not built on the gifts of the Spirit, even though we believe in them and operate in them. Absolutely. It's not built on grandiose preaching, even though we have great preaching. First Harvest Ministries, the way we will survive is a love for the doctrines of this ministry. Yep. Yep. That will be the first bar that will hold us all together. Brother Hartsfield, I'm speaking to the church and I hope those on Zoom are listening to me. The only way we're going to go beyond a starter movement is to be built on doctrine. Everything, every time this church gets together, last night watching your little moon bows, let me tell you, doctrine needs to slip into every conversation. If our church, our ministry, if all we have is a sound system and a stage, with a nice get-together, we are nothing more than a venue. We're a wedding venue. We're no different than a, a, a venue. We're just a, a venue. Hallelujah. Darling, I left the venue Come on. Yeah. called Christianity. I left it. Oh, I didn't leave it to start another one. All right. 
I'm not looking to build something so we can all just get together. You understand? That's what we, we got one in your town right down the street from your house. There's venues everywhere. It must be our doctrines of knowing who Yahshua is, knowing what the kingdom of God is, understanding our role in that kingdom. What is the third temple? What is the Maseroth? These doctrines are the bar. The Bible said after they received the word, they continued steadfastly in the doctrines of the church. Who's got one of my booklets handed here? You see these booklets? I always know who's not going to be with us next year. I don't see any of these in their hands. This is everything. These are everything. Why? Because we take the Word and explain the Word to you in such a way to where you don't have to hide from the Word anymore. You can devour it. The doctrine of this ministry is that first bar that will keep us together. You know how I know? I'm sort of like the disciples when Yahshua said, Hey guys, are y'all going to leave too? They said, please tell us where we would go. You've got the truth. You've got the truth. Where would we go? If we go to a Sabbath keeping church, if we go to the Seventh Day Adventist church, they believe in the Trinity. And they don't keep the holy days. If we go over here to this church, where would we go? Build yourself on these doctrines. And you'll be here when Yahshua returns. We'll all be together. Build it. For example, have you heard the true gospel? This pamphlet ought to be in every person's hands you ever meet. This booklet right here causes people to think. What do you mean the true gospel? There's only one gospel. No, there's not. Amen. That's right. There's many gospels. Do you know the true gospel? That booklet right there. Your This ministry has to be, this is the bars that hold us together. From the blood to the battle holds us together. Samson, do you understand the story of Samson, what it really means? If not, that holds us together. Trading Santa for the sukkah, the holidays of this world, holds us together. The ministry of Satan, and there's, I don't know where all the rest of them are. I was supposed to bring a bunch of them. There, we have tons of these booklets, free of charge. That's a bar. Man. If I was to go around this room right now and ask you about doctrines of this ministry, For example, what is the heavenly council? How many angels sit on the heavenly council? If you don't know these things, the Maserat, why? Where was the gospel first written? In the Maserat. When you understand these truths, brother Jeffrey, when you get them in your spirit, there's, you can't fall away. This is a bar that will keep First Harvest Ministries in unity. Because if somebody comes to you with a complaint about Elder Baker, you can say, well, if I was here for her, that would bother me. But I'm here for these doctrines. Say it again. That's exactly right. First stop. That's one of the doctrines of the church right there. Conflict resolution. The doctrines of the church. How do we handle conflict? These are the first bar. The problem with every move of God. Are we not on? It says unable to establish the connection to Zoom. Are we not on Zoom anymore? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Y'all mighty quiet in Zoom world. <laughs> Anybody out there on Zoom? He's trying to make enough noise for him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Amen, Pastor. Yes, Shabbat Shalom. For example, the rapture of the church, Hallelujah. the tribulation, We're here. Hallelujah. all of these things, spend your life learning these truths, and that's a bar that will keep us all together. The next bar, the one Satan hates, 
and the one he will do everything in the world to make sure you don't understand it. Fellowship. The Bible said that these people in that early church, that salvation was not enough. Baptism was not enough. Even doctrine wasn't enough. They had to have what's missing in today's church. Fellowship. Not a get together. There's a difference. Fellowshipping around something. Amen. They can now the world we live in. What's happened in the messianic movement in this movement, this Hebrew roots movement? What's happened is we thought when God called us out of Babylon into the wilderness that He planned on us dying in the wilderness. No, 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 John the Baptist. He brought you to the wilderness to send you back into Israel. Don't you understand? John the Baptist didn't die in the wilderness. He went back into the, to Israel. But all these people that, I'm just alone with God. Baby, you've been alone with Him 20 years. I mean, when do you plan on going back into fellowship? Yep. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't trust people. Get over it. <laughs> well, somebody hurt me, and they're going to hurt you again. Get over it. Fellowship. Why do you think we're having this regional meeting today? Because those of you that live out here in the wilderness, you're not there at headquarters where we all gather every Sabbath and enjoy. You're out here in the wilderness. I'm here today because you need fellowship. Thank you. Hallelujah. You need fellowship. If not, you'll become an island and you won't be connected to the work that Yahweh is doing throughout the earth today. Right now, in Kenya, there is a group just like this one gathering in fellowship under these doctrines. In Scotland, why? We are fellow, listen to me and listen carefully. Satan knows if he can pull you away from the ecclesia. Why do you think that Yahweh demanded in His Word? I think I'll read it actually. Three times a year. I'm demanding you to fellowship. Amen. Because he said, if you ever miss one of them, Satan will huff and puff and he will blow this house down. If you make the holy days, oh, well, we just keep it at our house. That's not what he said. He said three times a year, three times you're going to leave your houses and I'm going to force you to fellowship. I'm going to make you get around people you don't even like. Why? Because if I can get you around my people, instead of them people you've been living among, I'll keep your head straight. And fellowship requires us to learn to be like Christ, forgiving one another, overlooking one another, helping one another bear each other's burdens. And you know, the reason we don't want to fellowship, we're afraid people won't see we're perfect and that we actually are worried about something or crying about Satan wants you out of fellowship. Notice what I just read. They had received the word. They had been baptized, but they would have all the whole building would have fell without fellowship. Amen. Most people don't want fellowship because it means accountability. Most people can fool you for one or two services. But you start figuring them out, they don't want to be around fellowship. Absolutely. Yahweh says, hey, the more you fellowship with me, the more I'm going to fall off that pedestal and you're going to realize I'm just a normal fellow. Fellowship puts all the fellows in the same ship. And we realize, you know what? Pastor's not a saint. He's a broken man like me. He, I can do this. Satan hates fellowship. Those watching me on Zoom, quit making excuses of why you cannot make it to the gathering of the feast. You must learn to fellowship with one another. 
I'd like to show you Satan's Amen, strategy. Amen, Pastor. Thank you, my brother. Oh, Brother Rickman, Elder Rickman, I hear you. Oh, I love that man. Amen, Pastor. Love you. Hallelujah. I love Amen, you. Amen, Pastor. Darling. We love you here. I love you, my son. Bless you. Now, I want to show you. Pastor, we love you. We I love, love you, you. darling. Y'all don't know. I got it. love in my ears right here. They're all telling me they love me. We love you. <laughs> I love you, darling. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read it. I want to show you a scripture the Messianics don't like. Hebrews 10, 25. And I'm done. Now, look, the sermon's over. I'm just on borrowed time right now. Hebrews 10, 25. I'd like somebody to read that for me, Elder Baker. Not for six. Not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What does the Bible say? Don't forsake the assembling together. Well, you know why? Why did Paul write that? Did he have? Did he have nothing else to write? He knew this is one of the boards. This is one of the rods that will yeah. keep this ministry strong. Don't forsake. When you find out there's a regional meeting in your region, get to it. Get to it. Brother Vaughn, I don't have the money. Then you need faith. You don't need money. Tell the Lord, I want to be there. I want to obey your word and watch money happen. Call your state elders. Say, hey, I don't have the money to come, but I want to be there. And watch how we'll get you there. We help one another here. Amen. We got people here today that didn't have to pay for a room. Why? You want to be here? We'll get you here. God will make a way. Don't forsake the assembling. Well, what does assembling mean? I'm glad you asked because here's the word for it right here. It's the Greek word. What does it mean? Gathering together. A gathering together in one location. One place. A complete collection. Don't forsake the complete collection of the people. Amen. If you are not fellowshipping, I told you when I started, all the movements that have fallen. Number one, we didn't say get together, just have a potluck dinner. You've got to fellowship around the apostles' doctrine. You've got to fellowship around this message. Otherwise, it's nothing different than the than than a, than a, 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 a what's the groups I'm thinking of, uh, Kiwanis, and that's just a group gathering is all it is. But when you're gathering around the first rod. Your fellowship and your conversation is about the last truth you've learned from the Word of God. You're now encouraging one another. I'm begging you to become people of fellowship. Long for it. Live for it. I want to tell you all a story. Y'all don't know this. Well, some of you do. This man and this woman, when they first heard this message, they received the Word with gladness and then they were baptized. But they would drive from right here all the way to my church in Mississippi. Every month, they would drive for the fellowship of the headquarters church. That's why they're still here today. Amen. You won't make it without fellowship. You'll begin to, I know, well, God's withdrawn me for, I've never found that anywhere in the scriptures where he takes you away from the fellowship of the saints. Now, he'll take you away from the fellowship of Babylon, but not the true saints Amen. of Yahweh. Why? We are one another's strength. Hallelujah. I love rod number three. Y'all need to be eating together. We're fixing to. The, uh, now, some people unfortunately think that means taking communion. No, it does not affix and approve it to you. The breaking of bread is not communion. No, 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 no. I'll prove that in just a moment. In this verse, the breaking of bread follows the word fellowship. 
What is she saying? They were fellowshipping around a meal. Why do y'all think when you come to first to headquarters, there is food every few hours? Amen. We're obeying the third rod. We're breaking bread together. Do you know why? In every society, I don't care where it is, the ultimate expression of love is, hey, let's go grab a bite to eat together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why after every Sabbath at our church we have a meal afterwards. We're not doing that just to have food. We can get food at the house. Do you understand? We're breaking bread together. Right. And the fourth rod that will hold us together Prayer. Prayer. You put those four rods in this building. Doctrine. Fellowship. Breaking of bread. And prayer. And I give you my word. This ministry will stand. We'll be here when Yahshua returns. Blowing a silver trumpet. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you all for coming out today. I'm going to pray a prayer. Over. Isn't she speaking? Oh, hang on. I'm just speaking to. There we go. We're hang back. On. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything so far? Anything we've discussed? Any any doctrines? Anything that we mentioned that you would like clarification on? Anything? Go ahead, Sister Herky. Say it again. Did I bring pamphlets? I was supposed to. Yes, ma'am. I was asked to. The elders told me to. And uh, it is what it is. But they are free of charge. Email, I'll give you the email address. Ask Janice to send you as many as you need. You can download them and go print them at Office Depot. They know exactly how to do them. Yep. They'll, they'll print them just like that for you. Do them in black and white. It's a lot cheaper. Trust me. We spend about $5,000 a month on printing pamphlets. Yep. To get the message out. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Praise Yahweh. That means y'all are hungry. <laughs> All right. To my Zoom class, I love every one of you. Bless love you. Bless you. Love, love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Bless you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.